Okay. We're going to wait a few more seconds um, before we actually begin. But good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Okay, so let's go right in. We have a lot to cover today and it's uh, going to be really interesting and exciting. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I am Lucia Rodriguez, uh, the Director of the Masters in Development Practice Secretariat, or MDP Secretariat for short. The MDP is a one to two year graduate degree program on sustainable development practice. Um, it is a program in, I would say, 30 plus academic institutions in 26 countries around the world. It is my honor to open this session, Decolonizing Sustainable Development Education, which is made possible by members of the global network of MDP programs, specifically Karen Brown from the University of Minnesota, USA, Nina Miller, Regis University, USA, and Yolanda Steenkamp, University of Pretoria, South Africa. In addition, of course, to several key members of the MDP community who you will meet shortly. I would also like to thank SDSN's SUG Academy. We are very grateful and thankful for them. It is because of their belief in the value of the MDP and the encouragement and opportunities that they have offered us to continue to grow and expand that we are here today. So SDG Academy, thank you. So let us begin with what we believe will be an exciting and thought provoking session. Over to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Lucia. Uh, as Lucia mentioned, the Global Association of Masters of Development Practice Programs is truly a global network with programs around the world. My name is Karen Brown, and I co-chair the Masters of Development Practice at the University of Minnesota. A core aspect of our programs globally has always been a concern with social justice and equity. Recent years have seen an increased focus on decolonizing development in practice and development studies in the classroom. Our conversations around social justice in recent years have been increasingly urgent as we explore ways to infuse equity throughout our programs. This session seeks to explore what it means to decolonize development education and offer examples of how MDP programs globally are addressing this imperative. We want to consider how development education programs can effectively teach about questions of colonial legacies in development, anti-racist and anti-sexist frameworks for development, alternative visions for development, and establishing equitable collaborations in local and international contexts. The session will feature a wonderful speaker, Professor Vanessa Andriotti, who will frame the conversation for us. MDP faculty will then offer their perspectives on the critical issue of in inequitable power relations in development practice and education. I'm very excited about today's conversation. I now have the honor of introducing today's framing speaker, Dr. Vanessa Andriotti. Dr. Andreotti is Professor of Educational Studies at the newly appointed and the newly appointed Interim Director of the Peter Wall Institute at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Dr. Andreotti is Canada Research Chair in Race, Inequalities and Global Change. Her research examines historical and systemic patterns of reproduction of inequalities and how these limit or enable the possibilities for collective existence and global change. Her publications in this field include analyses of political economies of knowledge production, discussions of the ethics of international development, and critical comparisons of ideals of globalism and internationalization in education and global activism, with an emphasis on representations of and relationships with marginalized communities. Her work in teacher education conceptualizes education as an expansion of frames of reference and fields of signification with a view to expanding possibilities for ethical solidarities. Her academic work is committed to protecting the public role of the university as critic and conscience of society and a space of independent, multi-voiced, critically informed and socially accountable debates about alternative futures. 
Dr. Andriotti uh, also has some very interesting new work that she will speak with us about today. And I will now turn the podium over to you, Dr. Andriotti. Welcome, and we're very excited to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, in Canada, generally, we start our conversations with an acknowledgement of the land. So I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the unceded lands of the Stolo, the Kwantlen, and the Katsi Indigenous peoples. But I'm also coming from a mixed family of Indigenous and German ancestry. So I would like to do the land acknowledgement as I was taught uh, from, in, from my mom's community, uh, which is a Guarani community in Brazil. So in that land acknowledgement, we actually acknowledge the land first as a living entity, not a property or resource. Uh, we uh, also acknowledge that uh, our ancestors are present with us today. Uh, the ancestors are not just those who have come before us, but also those yet to come. And that comes with a huge responsibility. And part of that acknowledgement uh, that our ancestors are here is the acknowledgement of all the sacrifices that have uh, been made for us to be here today, including sacrifices related to the food that we eat, the clothes that we, that we wear. But in the online situation, we need to remember that the minerals for the computers that we are using come from communities. Um, that probably have not been treated right in this extraction. So uh, it's acknowledgement of the sacrifices and also of the violence that happens for, for us to be, to be together. Uh, then there is an acknowledgement um, of the people who are holding the space with us. So acknowledging all the, the panelists and the people who have held the space for us to be together. Thank you and thank you for inviting me here. The last acknowledgement is the acknowledgement that we're all relatives in a huge family that is not just human, that is also non-human and that goes beyond our uh, physical temporalities of, of the body. So with that acknowledgement, um, I'm trying to also signal towards other ways of being and other ways of existing uh, in the world that um, mainstream international <laughs> development has not honored uh, traditionally as part of, of uh, its theory and its practice. So I was asked to talk about today um, the question of decolonization and the title of my presentation is gesturing towards the colonial forms of sustainable development education. So I work with a collective called gesturing towards the colonial futures. And we chose the word gesture for the title of our collective to underscore the fact that decolonization is impossible when our livelihoods are underwritten by colonial violence and unsustainability. The food we eat, the clothes we wear, our health systems and social security, and the technologies that allow us to write about this are all subsidized by expropriation and by dispossession, by destitution, by genocides and ecocides. There's no way around it. We cannot bypass it. The only way is through it. So therefore, we have created a workspace where we can experiment with the colonial gestures that will undoubtedly and inevitably fail. How we fail is important, though. It's actually in the moments when we fail that the deepest learning becomes possible, and that is usually where we stumble upon something unexpected and extremely useful. So failing generatively in this work requires both intellectual and relational rigor. Um, today, what I'm going to talk about <laughs> with you are things that we use uh, in this work in relation to decolonization that we have found useful. And at the end, we may go back to the failures as well. Um, it's important to say from the outset that decolonization is understood very differently by different communities and by different people. Generally, when we talk about decolonization, we talk about the occupation of lands or and <laughs> the subjugation of peoples. The communities we work with, my collective works with, 
uh, they see decolonization a little bit differently. They say that decolonization is about our sense of separation from the land. So it's an ontological or ontometaphysical way of talking about it. So they say that colonization is a, a way where our way of being, not just our way of knowing, has been trapped in a very limited story, a very limited single story of uh, progress, development, human evolution that has given us some gifts, but it's extremely harmful as well. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a, an overview of what we do and then open up to the conversation. So um, my work has been uh, looking at global North and South relations, and I've been in this area for 20 years academically, but I was born in a family where my mom is indigenous, my dad is German, and my dad married my mom because he, um, his family, his other brothers were participating in indigenous genocide in Brazil during a period of agriculture expansion. So he wanted to interrupt that violence by marrying somebody who was uh, the victim of uh, state sanctioned violence. The problem with that was that he also believed in German cultural supremacy. So he believed that by whitening the future generations, he was helping. Uh, save the world. So his way of saving the world <laughs> was both, it was paradoxically both um, very progressive and uh, racist and very problematic. So I was born in a context, and I, I was born from the context actually, where uh, you can see these paradoxes everywhere. And um, for, for the first 24 years of my life, it was pretty difficult to get my head around what was happening in my family and its connections with what happens historically and systemically in the world. But I think that upbringing brought me to look at problematic patterns of representation, engagement, and translation between um, different forms of being in the world, different forms of activism, different forms of uh, thinking about change. So one of the things that uh, I did with a group of people was this heads up checklist. And this was published in 2012, but I think it represents uh, a lot of um, the kinds of things that uh, I've been working with and thinking about. So these are patterns that have uh, been identified in North-South relations. And this, his, this, this work has been done mainly through education. So when schools, for example, in the UK want to uh, connect with schools in one of the African nations and in for a school linking project, for example, right? So we analyzed it there. So um, there are seven patterns. Uh, one is the reproduction of hegemonic um, ways of thinking, the single universal story that I, I talked about before, single universal story of progress, development, evolution, and civilization. The second pattern is the it's ethnocentric uh, reasoning, uh, where one view is projected as universal. Uh, ahistorical, uh, the forgetting of historical legacies and complicities. Then there's D for depoliticized, uh, a disregard of power inequalities and ideologies. S for salvationist or, or self-serving, uh, this investment in self-congratulatory heroism. Then there's U for uncomplicated uh, interventions, the offer of few good quick fixes, and P uh, paternalistic, this infantilizing way of relating to the communities um, that people are trying to uh, allegedly help <laughs> and waiting for gratitude, for a thank you. Um, once the intervention is over. So what we have observed as well over the years is that if we try to interrupt any of these patterns, we come up with different problems. For example, if we try to interrupt the hegemonic story, generally we create another story to replace it that also becomes hegemonic. Um, if we try to interrupt a historical patterns, sometimes we fix 
on a single version of history that also is problematic. So this is not a checklist that you can say, I'm not doing this, that, that, that and the other, because this, the, the, what frames this checklist is what makes us intelligible to the world too. Uh, the other thing that uh, we found was that if people try to interrupt all of this at the same time, they become unintelligible to funders, for example, or unintelligible within the university. So one of the things that have been very that has been very useful um, in in working with all these complexities around uh, our patterns of engagement with each other that are historically and systemically conditioned is um, looking at different forms of psychoanalysis. Uh, and there's a book there called Confronting Desire, Psychoanalysis and International Development. Psychoanalysis looks at the colonization of our unconscious, not just our ways of thinking uh, or relating, but our desires. Right, so how how we uh, come to hope, how we come to uh, crave and yearn in the world, and that also involves how we've been traumatized in ways that we have not been able to process yet. And here I'm talking both about individual trauma and collective trauma. And I have found lots of resonances between psychoanalysis in the kinds of things that I analysis that I see in the communities. But of course, it's not the same thing. But psychoanalysis in academia really helps because it allows us to look at the problem of education through the lens of denials. So we have a list here of four denials that are reproduced in education, and they are very, very difficult to interrupt. So the first denial is the denial of systemic violence and complicity in harm, the fact that our comfort, securities, and enjoyments are subsidized by expropriation and exploitation somewhere else, like the example that I gave of the minerals that create the possibility for us to have computers and to be communicating online. The second is the denial of the limits of the planet, the fact that the planet cannot sustain exponential growth and consumption indefinitely, we are reaching its limits. The third is the denial of entanglement, our insistence in seeing ourselves as separate from each other and the land, rather than entangled within a living wider metabolism of the planet that is biointelligent. And the fourth is the denial of the magnitude and complexity of the challenges or the problems that we face, the difficulties that we will need to, fit, to face together, and this desire also to, um, to uh, find interventions that make us feel and look good, but that do not necessarily address the difficult things. Um, the other thing that um, psychoanalysis helps us to do is to look at modern colonial unconscious imprints. For example, we talk about the six C's of consumption, which is a mode of relationality marked by choice, comfort, convenience, certainty, calculus and control, the four A's of arrogance, the demands for autonomy, authority, arbitration and affirmation, the four P's of purpose, the desires for protagonism, purity, progress and privilege, and the three R's of redress, uh, which are limited to representation recognition and redistribution, and the three eyes of innocence, which is assumed indemnity, immunity, and impunity. So we've been working with this, uh, this list and ideas of how that manifests in education and how we can interrupt that. So one of the things that we found is the seesaw relational imprint that we have in colonialism, where we have uh, this plus one minus one um, dynamic. So in the plus one, we, we are either plus one or minus one. So the, the economy of worth of, of people is um, measured around that. So the plus one is the idealization and romanticization of ourselves. And the minus one is the vilification and patholization. So this doesn't happen not necessarily just about ourselves. This happens with everything. So we can be idealizing and romanticizing our students, our communities, or vilifying and pathologizing um, because we, the ways that we evaluate the world are, are uh, dependent on these economies. And we are talking about then how education can help us get to zero, where we can sit with the good, the bad, the broken, and the messed up of humanity within and all around us. So that is very much um, 
a kind of a, a directive that has come from the communities themselves, that education should help us address the, the imbalance that creates the hierarchies of knowing, the hierarchies between cultures, and that sustains the single story of progress. So I'll just, um, I'm looking at the time and I'm thinking that we need to, to, to pass a few slides. So, um, so we, what we propose in our uh, collective, and it may not work in other contexts, is this concept of depth education, which is about surfacing problematic aspects of our individual and collective unconscious, working from unknowability, disarming effective landmines, and egological defenses. So we're talking here about activating capacities that have been exiled by modernity coloniality. And that's our understanding of decolonization, when we find other ways of not only thinking or doing, uh, and even of relating, but of being together, of coexisting. And for that, we need negative capability, which is the capacity or disposition to engage with difficult issues and to be present for uncomfortable conversations without feeling overwhelmed, immobilized, or demanding to be rescued from discomfort. And we also need generative capability, which is the capacity or disposition to navigate volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, and to negotiate different sensibilities in context of historical and systemic dissonance with integrity and in generative ways. So in order to conclude, I'm just going to say that this practice then um, unfolds in many different ways, but one of the ways that we have uh, found useful for uh, working with this kind of education is to map the potholes on the road to decolonization and to have very clear, hyper self-reflexive questions. So I'll give you an example of what I mean by the hyper self-reflexive questions. So creating a practice where ourselves and our students and artists we work with and activists are always asking, especially if they are from the global north, they're always asking questions such as, to what extent am I reproducing what I critique? To what extent am I avoiding looking at my own complicities and denials and at whose expense? What am I doing this for? Who am I accountable to? What is my theory of change? What would I like to work, my work to move in the world? To what extent am I aware of how I'm being read by the communities, especially communities of high intensity struggle? Who in these communities would legitimately roll their eyes at what I'm doing uh, or find it indulgent or self-infantilizing? Who or what is this work really about? Who is benefiting the, benefiting the most from this work? And in what ways could this work be read as self-serving or self-congratulatory. So a lot of this work is summarized in the book that is just out, it came out yesterday, called Hospice in Modernity. It's not a book that I wrote by, by myself, it's a, a summary of the work of the collective. And there are other books also in the series that are from other people from the collective. But um, the book also talks about the stories that led us to the insights that, um, that um, we're working with. So it's not just a book, an academic book, it's a book of education, and it's a book that talks uh, more personally to the reader about why we're doing the work we're doing. So I think I'm gonna leave you with that um, and so that we can start this conversation. And I thank you again for inviting me to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Andreati. You've given us a lot of food for thought and I'm really excited to hear the conversation that's going to result from your remarks. I think a lot of the questions you've identified are exactly the questions that we're grappling with as we, as we try to um, work with our curriculum, our students and our programs and thinking about you know, what, what this work is for that we're doing. So thank you very much for giving us some, some tools and frameworks to think about that. I'm now very happy to introduce our session moderator who will lead us through the next portion of the session, Maria Margarita Fantasia Tirado. Margarita is a journalist with studies in history and a master's degree in sustainable development from the University of Florida. She has nearly a decade of experience working in international development, particularly in the areas of conservation, climate change, and governance. Her expertise focuses on public policy, grant management, 
communications and analysis, and communicating data and information to various types of audiences. She also has a strong background in managing multilateral cooperation and private investment resources, and establishing and upholding relationships with donors, local communities, and private and public institutions at different levels. She has recently started her PhD in rural studies at the University of Guelph in Canada. And I'm really delighted that she's agreed to be with us here today to facilitate the next section of our conversation. Margarita, I'll turn the podium over to you. Thank you for being here. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Vanessa, for providing us a point to start this panel. I'm really excited to be here with the scholars from around the world to discuss decolonization and sustainable development education. I would like to introduce Professor Lanre Olaniyam. He is the coordinator of the Development Practice Program at SAPTIN, and he is a senior lecturer in the Department of Economics in the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. He also has experience in social policy work in developing countries through which he had been able to interact and work with the senior, senior level technocrats and officials. Welcome, Professor Olaniyam. If you could please turn on your camera. Good morning, Professor. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Great, thank you. Also, I would like to welcome Professor Emily Van Uvelin. She is a faculty member in the Master of Development Practice at Regis University in the, universe, in the United States. Her research explores issues of equity, sustainability, and governance in relation to water and sanitation services. Good morning, Professor. And I also want to welcome Professor Swarup Dutta. He is an anthropologist and joined Terry University in India as a system professor. His research interest lies in sustainable development, agricultural anthropology, and environmental anthropology. Good morning or good afternoon, Professor. I'm not sure. It's good evening from my side. <laughs> <laughs> and good morning from Colombia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So thank you for being here to our three panelists, um, Vanessa, uh, for sharing your experience. Before starting, I just want to add some recommendations. So for panelists, because we have time so short in these kind of events, you will understand, and I apologize in advance if I have to interrupt you when time ends for answers and presentations. And for our audience, Please leave your questions using the Q&A button with your name and organization, and we will try to transfer your questions to our panelists. So again, this is an honor to be here and talk with you, professors. And I would like to invite Professor Swarov Dutta to share with us his thoughts regarding decolonization and his experience. Thank you. So uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Myself, uh, Swarup Datta from India. And I will be talking about my own experience in the Masters in Development Practice, uh, which uh, in our, uh, uh, our institute, which we call the MA in Sustainable Development Practice Program. Uh, before that, first, uh, we have very limited time for the discussion, so we'll, I will cut short my uh, discussion, which has already given by uh, Professor Vanessa. So, but in my opinion, what is a decolonization of education means that we, uh, we need to talk about, we need to revisit, we need to rethink, reframe and reconstruct the curriculum and research that preserve the Eurocentered and colonial lens. So that is uh, our opinion because a country like India, which was uh, 200 years of colonialism, we have, a, we have a long story of it. And we have, uh, and the till date, we are fighting for decolonization of our education system at large scale. Uh, 
and which is which is one of the most important because we our new education policy has come up in 2021 where we are emphasizing our education system at large scale to to to, to just uh, uh, to get rid of, of of our decolonization of the thinking process thought process research and so we are currently revisiting rethinking and reframing and reconstructing our curriculum uh, overall and and to be very specific uh, it is what i think that uh, education decolonization of education actually challenge the existing institutional hierarchy and the monopoly of on knowledge and which is very very important and crucial for our students to understand that that this is uh, this is uh, not um, uh, this is not a uh, you know uh, a discussion where we always talk about the uh, uh, not supremacy we also talk talk about uh, we need to talk about the knowledge sharing we also talk about the hierarchical system which is already prevalent okay and also we need to talk about about the you know uh, north and south balance global north and south balance for it now decolonization uh, in the sustainable development educations first of all we have to accept it we have to accept it that uh, our education system uh, is under uh, uh, the decolonization uh, process and we are under the colonial influence that have, that acceptance uh, matters a lot so the reality is that we are decolonizing the sustainable development education that means that we are acknowledging an ongoing legacies and continuities of colonialism and imperialism and then we are uh, we have to radically delink ourselves from the continuities of inequalities inequities that are being repeated through neoliberalism so my point of uh, uh, argument here that we need to focus more on the inequalities and inequities a country like india which is multilingual which is we have uh, 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 you know um, uh, hundreds more than hundreds of language more than 5 1500 uh, unofficial language to 122 official language so this is a this is a big barrier for us to uh, for the decolonization process the language is one of the major uh, problem uh, we face across uh, the country Where uh, the single language, whether it is Hindi or whether it is uh, English, we are still uh, on this direction, whether we should completely talk about in Hindi or we completely change towards the English. So that is uh, a major issue that we are already facing. Now, second point is the colonial legacies of the development are very important to address and the colonial logics are still at the heart of the development education curriculum because many development projects, they are very, very much, uh, their, their, their philosophy is mostly based on the colonialism and that we have to think we have to rethink that we it should be more inclusive and all and critics of the colonialism called the modern development as a creative adjustment of the coloniality whereby the colonialist logics and the imperative still remain socially politically economically and ecologically now how can uh, the development education programs be effectively taught about the questions of colonial legacy so uh, most of the cases it happens that in indian universities were, were not available uh, institutions so we have the caste conflict which is a very big conflict uh, and uh, in india we have the conflict related to religion uh, gender discrimination class conflicts racial conflicts if every conflicts every form of conflicts are present in overt or covert way in the country it's a country like india and I am coming from the background of anthropology, and anthropology itself is coming uh, has come to India uh, with the with the British. Uh, 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 and uh, in I still remember that uh, in our course curriculum, all the all the readings, all the courses which are largely uh, given by the colonial, uh, 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 you know, anthropologists. So we are, uh, you know, uh, um, specialized in, uh, and we have a specialization on the ethnography, which is largely dominated by the colonial ethnographer like Führer, Führer von Hemendorf, uh, Bronislaw Malinowski. So they are all uh, worked uh, exclusively uh, for uh, for uh, various uh, uh, colonial government, and uh, and we have the colonial anthropology as well. So coming from that background, my every time I is to ask myself that we have to get rid of all this uh, colonial curriculum of uh, doing anthropology. Then I joined uh, the MA in Sustainable Development Practice uh, uh, six years back after doing a lot of uh, getting a lot of experience from the government and private sector. I finally decided to join, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in an organization where I can introduce my way of understanding the development practice uh, from uh, uh, 
from, from, from the anthropological lens. And therefore, I joined MA SDP in 2016. The current SDP program in Terry School of Advanced Studies is structured you know, to address the critical gaps in sustainable development education with specific thrust on combining the theory and uh, theory and rich classrooms teachings and rigorous field training. It aims at training the development professionals and equipping them with the cross-sectoral problem-solving skills. So here you see that we are slowly and gradually moving out of the, uh, uh, the typical or traditional way of doing our research, and we are moving towards more at, uh, uh, at the grassroots level. And, and this particular program, which is the MSDP program, which was uh, uh, which is uh, uh, one of its kind program in India itself, because uh, there is no program in India they. Uh, we only talk about the sustainable development practice. So in, in this sense, uh, the India's, uh, uh, in a, I mean, Teddy School of Advanced Studies is one of its kind program. Now, if you if you look at our students' background, and we are uh, accepting the students from the various disciplines, be it social science, be it natural, physical, and applied science, and, uh, and others like uh, business administration, journalism, and humanities. And also, we have a huge uh, cultural background. So people are live, you know, talking in Bengali, Hindi, Gujarati, Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, Kashmiri, Assamese, Punjabis, and so on. We also have a, a club background of uh, international students who are act, uh, who were there in the uh, in the campus before the pandemic, and they were actively doing uh, a, 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 you know successfully passed uh, uh, the uh, the MA in SDP. So if you if you look at the students representation from the countries so you will be surprised that there are huge uh, 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 you know number of countries are here uh, you know Bhutan Kenya Nepal Zimbabwe Mexico Afghanistan Ethiopia Sudan Burma that is Myanmar and Laos and also uh, different uh, several other countries like Cambodia and all now, several steps have been taken for MA-SDP program curriculum. The first step that I personally uh, uh, realized that for in the, when I joined in the campus, and I thought that I think I should introduce some uh, uh, courses which will actually uh, delink the colonial legacy. So I will come back to that discussion. And uh, we start uh, doing the revisiting the development ideologies in existing course curriculum, and, do, and, and, and therefore we introduce the course or the models which directly reflects on the issues related to uh, deep-rooted social stratification, asymmetric power relations, and universalizations of Western knowledge, and questioning the hegemonic practices. So therefore, we are uh, um, we have uh, decolonized our syllabi up to certain extent, and uh, and it, uh, we are also doing our uh, program review right uh, right now. I mean, we for next uh, five months or six months, we are dedicated ourselves for reviewing the program, and we uh, will be taking the the the, the decolonization aspects uh, at a large scale. So here you see that we have I have just shown few courses which directly talk about the decolonization. The courses like integrated approaches to sustainable development practices, law, society, and sustainable development, perspectives on development, and in the same um, too we have development uh, economics and all. Uh, so we have uh, Professor Duya, just a quick reminder that you have like one minute left. All right, Sorry. All right. All right. Yes, so if you see that uh, the uh, the few examples of it, so here you see that uh, few course curriculum uh, over there that we directly talk about the colonialism and neo-colonialism, these are few courses I have just mentioned here. And the last part is that, that we have to prioritize the epistemologies and methodologies. So holism towards a more holism, less reductionism, we need to go for the co collaborative engagements and elevating the marginalized voice. And therefore, uh, we have to overcome, we have to uh, uh, so give more space to the Southern scholars also, and decolonization of the methodological aspects also very important here. Okay, say for example, uh, we'll talk about the peer assessment, storytelling, going out to the community and so on. So here are a few uh, uh, field bits assessment, but my students used to go for the field work for say, for example, Islamophobia and its impact on the Muslim woman in Delhi. Ethnic entrepreneurism, the case of Northeastern people in Delhi. So these uh, uh, studies has already been conducted by my students, which are largely uh, inclusive and which largely thought provoking in terms of the new, uh, for the sustainable development practice students. So there are a few lists I have given, if you want, I can share the slides with you. 
And also you can see our program is the group practicum, which is very, very crucial where the students are going for the poorest of the poorest part of the country and they do conduct the field survey uh, with the local people and get the uh, understanding of the real problem. And also we conduct the seminars for, uh, uh, you know, regularly we used to have the sustainable development livelihood uh, uh, opportunities and challenges, reducing inequalities. So here you see that we start, we engage with the students uh, uh, at, uh, we conduct the workshop for this. You see that our 2018 seminar, uh, 2019, we have the, the students are presenting their work in front of the experts. And also you see the panels are there for discussing the livelihood, sustainable livelihood matters. And also the way forward that we should, decolonization should not be the discourse or the metaphor, only rather it should be the affirmative practices. Questioning on the modernity and coloniality is oneself in everyday life and constantly learning from the critical sources of education oneself from the hegemonic knowledge and ideologies by reading broadly and deeply and resisting and challenging the neoliberal capitalism. So I'm just ending my uh, discussion here. Here you see that in the 2017, 2018 and 2019, here it is started with the black and white. Slowly and gradually the color changes. The student revolted. Students said no to the corporate uh, way of uh, taking the photographs. So they have started with the colorful dresses. They said uh, they uh, they said that we are not. It is only one uh, uh, program of the of the of the institution where they said no to black and white or the neoliberal corporate look. So they said we will go for the colorful and we will click the uh, 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 formal photograph in this. So by saying that, I'm uh, I'm uh, completing my session. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you, Professor Duda, for sharing us your experience and how the campus and the students are participating in a more decolonized environment. So I would like to introduce Professor Emily Van Hulin. Uh, Professor, so over to you. Thank you. So I'm an assistant professor at Regis University, which is located in Denver, Colorado in the USA and it is on the land of the Ute and the Cheyenne and the Arapaho. And I'll be representing our team today talking about decolonizing pedagogies in our online synchronous global classroom. A little bit about our classroom. Half of our students are located in the physical classroom and half of them are joining online. And most of those students joining online are from the global self. Most of our students are development practitioners. So they're students who want to keep getting better at their development practice and gain a more holistic understanding of development. And consistent with the Global MDP Association, we are following sort of an interdisciplinary curriculum. And because of the diversity of our students, it has, forced, it has posed some challenges and also some opportunities, but it has forced us to think very intentionally about how we decolonize our program. So we've come up with these four dimensions and dynamics, um, kind of a conceptual map for how we see decolonization in our program, starting with the students and faculty who's in the room. <clears throat> Often in the United States, you'll have a development studies classroom where you have a group of privileged students sort of studying about the other. And we're trying to shake that up by making sure that we have a diversity of students in terms of identity and backgrounds and experiences both faculty and students. <clears throat> and we're using this classroom format, the synchronous online classroom and this deliberate composition of students to equalize the power dynamics that can form in the classroom. In terms of the curriculum and the program, we're really trying to make sure that the curriculum is relevant to students' experience. It reflects the realities that we're re representing a diversity of voices but also that students have the academic support they need to be successful. In terms of the technology, um, many online classes can have a sort of disembodied um, effect where students feel like they can't really fully express themselves. They aren't connected to other people. We're in our program really trying to challenge that. We're trying to ensure that students come with high quality video and audio. <clears throat> and we've come up with some strategies to help animate the classroom that I'll talk about. The focus of this presentation though is really on the pedagogy, how we bring these um, decolonizing ideologies and mindsets into the classroom. And we've been developing a set of pedagogies through some rigorous research that we've been doing over the last three going on four years now, where we have about 250 um, surveys that are done at the end of every class by the students. We've done focus groups with faculty, self-reflections from faculty, 
and also observations of recorded classes um, that have taken place on Zoom where we're looking at how students participate, how students respond to different pedagogies um, and which pedagogies are most effective at decolonizing the classroom. So this is the set of decolonizing pedagogies that we've come up with through this research. I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these. The first is about building community. We really see this as the foundation for building trust, for having deeper conversations, for moving past uh, stereotypes. So we really create time in our class to build this community. Second is about having students learn from each other. So this really decenters the instructor as the sole authority. And because we have such rich, rich experience in our class from the development practitioners, they bring that experience and also their cultural knowledge into the classroom. And they're able to share that horizontally with each other. And it also provides a way to have this global perspective in our class and to innovate, innovatively address development challenges. Third is on opening spaces for participation. And this is creating um, pathways, um, spaces online where students feel like they can fully be themselves, where they can share their backgrounds and their culture and their values. And we do this through some of the traditional tools like breakout groups, but we've also partnered with a local theater group to bring things like storytelling and uh, gestures and role playing into the classroom. Fourth, um, decentering Western voices and epistemologies. So this is um, ensuring that our syllabi, our case studies, our readings um, reflect diverse voices and perspectives. We have um, professors from the global South and from native communities in the United States teaching in our program. And we try and also instill this, um, non, these non-Western perspectives through collaborative teaching and partnerships that we have with community groups. Fifth is the kind of the Freerian cycle of uh, critical reflection and thinking and transferring that into action. So we, we do do a lot of critical reflection, but we wanna make sure that's grounded and that students have a way of applying it to their development practice. As one of our students said, what I learned on Monday, I applied to in the field on Tuesday. So we, that cycle is very tight in our program. And finally, creating connection in virtual spaces. So we see technology really as the medium for facilitating human connection and equalizing the experiences between um, students that are in class and students that are remote. So we have a lot of clear technology protocols for um, making that happen. And we found that this the synchronized online classroom can be a very transformative learning environment, which offers even more tools and spaces for decolonizing the classroom than a traditional classroom. So this is just a snapshot of our data here. Some of the types of questions we ask at the end of the class surveys. You can see they reflect um, how students are responding to the instructor, how students are responding to the content and how students are relating to each other. So we're looking at the power dynamics involved in those types of relationships. And we feel um, pretty happy with where we are now as a program and we've gotten better over time. But this is the percentage of students who agree or strongly agree with these statements. And when we stratify this data by, um, by English as a first language and by students that are in class versus remote, we find no evidence that international students have any less effective or engaging of a learning experience. Um, We've also found ways to extend these pedagogies outside of the traditional classroom and community-based research classes that we've run over the last couple of years. Um, just recently this summer, this past summer, um, we ran a course on water and sanitation access for the unhoused in Denver, Colorado. And that was partnering with local activists and nonprofit groups where students learned from this partnership they also attended uh, mutual aid events. They witnessed these uh, sweeps or traumatic displacements that have been happening very frequently in our, in our city. The second one I wanna talk about briefly is a partnership we have with Danette College on the Navajo Nation, where students um, came together across these institutions to learn about environmental issues from an indigenous and Western perspective. They learned from elders and activists and medicine men and scholars. Um, 
And we had a little grant for this one where we're able to bring a couple of students from Africa to share and learn from the group. And as one of our Ghanaian students who came over said, she was very excited to see some of the commonalities between the indigenous perspectives and the work that she's doing in her community and to bring those ideas and relationships back to the work that she's doing. Um, finally, something that we're looking forward to in the future and how we're going to build on this work is with um, a grant that we recently received for doing research from the Spencer Foundation and paying attention to that second research question. What we're interested in is how these pedagogies that we're using in the classroom translate into students' development practice. And we're going to be approaching this through um, surveys that we're giving to our alumni, through focus groups that we're going to engage them in, and also through um, video storytelling, where we're going to have them tell stories about their development work. And we're seeing this as sort of an innovative way to come up with a metrics for evaluating what decolonized practice looks like, and also of a, a pilot or a way of testing this as a decolonized methodology in itself. So that's what we're doing in the future. And I'm very thankful for everyone for organizing this panel. And I'd love to hear from anyone else doing similar work. Please give us, um, send us an email. And I'm joined here um, by the director of our program, Nina Miller, who you can also email. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Emily Van Huling. Uh, now, Thank you for providing with great examples about your presentation. Um, and now uh, we, I would like to pass the, the, the word to the Professor Lamre Olanian for showing us the examples of decolonization and sustainable development in the University of Ibadan. So Professor, welcome. What? Hello, good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It's a pleasure to be here too, and to be part of this great conversation on how to decolonize sustainable development. I'm here to share the experience that we have at Ibadan, Nigeria. Uh, and I think it's, we have a lot of commonalities with many of the uh, presentations that we've had earlier on. I want to sincerely thank Vanessa for that introductory speech. It has really shown the extent of the problems and the issues surrounding uh, colonization and decolonization. Uh, so I present my own uh, perspectives um, only just to make that we cannot talk about decolonization without talking about colonization. Uh, so it is an offshoot of colonization uh, and what people are, are not sure of is whether what we have presently is actually a decolonization or post-colonization. And these are some of the issues that has to be corrected uh, that should be included in the educational activities that different uh, countries have, and which we also have at Ibada. It's important to note that decolonization, despite the fact that it's lent itself to multiple definitions, is about perspectives and mindsets. Uh, it is also about who is telling the story it is about where the power lies and where the control lies. Uh, at the end of the day, it impacts directly on inequalities, poverty and prosperity of nations. And that's why uh, for those of us in education sector and indeed the higher education sector, it is important for us to acknowledge uh, the existence of colonization and how to decolonize it. And to also have a time frame of when we think this colonization will eventually uh, end. So these are some of the issues that I think uh, are important for us to follow. The area is the, the idea of this decolonization becomes more problematic given the development practice program that we all run uh, because the definition of development itself has been conceived has to do with the idea and the mindset that there are areas that are underdeveloped as a result of some power structure that has existed in the past. And that leads to a lot of issues uh, on how to decolonize, where to decolonize and when to decolonize. Uh, but it's important to note 
that four issues has to be concerned uh, by the time we discuss all these decolonization issues. And that has to do with the issue of personal mastery and historical facts. Uh, the area of decolonization has to understand what exactly we are decolonizing. And what we are decolonizing also depends on our mental modes and the mindset of everybody within the education stakeholders. So it is important uh, to note that as we decolonize in our different perspectives and our different universities, we also need to talk about ethics and value. The problem with decolonization is that ethics and values are not necessarily universal. And they are also, uh, they are also different by countries and by different uh, activities that we have to do. And that's the essence of the MDP program as we have it. Uh, the reason why we have the MDP program is to be able to look at development practice and development studies in a different perspectives as one that is not owned by a particular society or one that is jointly owned with shared values, with shared objectives and with shared outcome perspectives. And that's the reason why the MDP was designed the way it is designed. And at the University of Ibadan, we are exceedingly happy that we are part of that. Uh, the Ibadan MDP approach is that we should integrate all aspects of development, economic, social, cultural, environmental, and objective of uh, the development, because this is the way for us to be able to achieve the area of decolonization as we are talking about it. It actually provides us an avenue for advanced interdisciplinary training uh, so that we know, and uh, in our past years, we have begun to understand that the issue of decolonization by perspectives also differ from even within the country, from society to society, tribal lineage, even within Nigeria, and also when we compare different countries with other countries. So we have a structure of decolonization that's we think we need to follow if we have to achieve all this. And there are about six aspects of decolonization that we need to follow. One is not superior to the other. They must be jointly achieved if we want to achieve the full and complete decolonization in education and as well as development education sector. That has to do with decolonization of the curriculum. And I think Emilia has talked a lot about uh, what is being done uh, on decolonization of curriculum. Most of the things she presented is what we also do at Ibadan, as well as the colonization of the teaching learning activities, because we can have a curriculum, but the way it is being delivered, the pedagogy of delivery can also impeach having full decolonization uh, as well. There's also the colonization of research and knowledge production. Uh, we'll find out that knowledge is being produced at many fronts, but at times this knowledge does not find its way to the white world. And that's why we also need to look at the colonization of publications and knowledge sharing. Uh, there are also there are so many uh, odds in some areas about perception on where to publish, how to publish, how to disseminate, and who gets to read what. And this is also part of the issues for the education sector, especially the higher education sector. There's also the decolonization of funding sources and financing of education perspective and mindset of who are funding this education and what they expect as result from the, the effort for their funding. The last one has to do with for decolonization of community engagement and services. So in order to do this, uh, we have followed the MDP main curriculum that had four main uh, pillars and that's every development practitioner must be knowledgeable about everything and be able to discuss about everything. The four pillars in the original MDP curriculum has to do with social sciences, earth sciences, natural sciences, as well as my own sciences. But one thing that Ibadan has introduced into our curriculum as part of the decolonization is the indigenous knowledge perspectives, as well as culture and peace and conflict issues. This is what we have always included as a fifth pillar in the, in the core competencies for the MDP curriculum. As, and then the way we have done it has to do with the pedagogy of teaching, the composition of teaching staff at Ibadan. We have about 63 staff, uh, of 63 faculties from various disciplines, such that if we pick a particular, a particular course, uh, we look at the different perspectives, 
knowing that development is multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and cross-disciplinary. And we also want to acknowledge the global classroom that was that is being organized by the Global MDP Association. It has been a very novel idea for people to share their knowledge and to also have perspective from different staff since the facilitators come from different countries. Uh, and the pedagogy of method that we have also used include field trips. Uh, I see that in the one by Emily, she has shown both of the things that have been presented. And I think these are the things that we have also presented at the University of Ibadan. Our research activities are also... Professor, sorry for interrupting you. Just a reminder, you have one minute left. Thank you. Okay, I'll close now. I'll close this short while. So we have also benefited from a way of trying to broadening the research and knowledge activities that we have done. And the rest of people that benefited from the IFAD University Win Win program, we have 40 students went to about six or seven countries for with credible knowledge production. This has added to our research output. In decolonizing publication, it's always difficult for those from the global south to publish. And if I don't have a journal, we can journal of sustainable development. And many people from the MDP Global Association, both from the north and the south, have published here. And I'm aware that the Global MDP Association is also trying to act to bring a special edition of what has been done by the MDP groups programs on this. In decolonizing the community engagement, we have engaged in workshops, seminars, and outreaches. And I think uh, it is important to note that one of the things that we should continue doing is about the Masters Development Practice Global Association, because it has led so many of us to know ourselves, to shape our thoughts, to shape our values and mindset, and how to engage better on how to decolonize sustainable development education. Uh, there are examples of what I think should be done, but what is important at the end of the day is that the colonization is about level playing ground and everybody must be involved. I thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It was really interesting to see the three different examples from three different universities around the world and how different MDP courses and curriculum are going towards decolonization. So I will invite uh, Professor Duda, Professor Van Hubelin, and Professor Olanian to please turn on your cameras and your microphones. Um, for our audience, please uh, send us your questions using the Q&A button. We will try to answer all your questions here and during the panel. Uh, Professor Andretti, thank you for joining us. So this is the space of Q&As, and I would love to, to start with one question, which is, you have already shown us what you are doing in your different universities to decolonize the curriculums. But considering what um, Dr. Andreori was telling us about failures or the opportunity to grow through failure. So I would like you to, to tell us to, yeah, to tell us and to share with us what has not worked on the path of decolonization. And what do you learn from this experience in your classes and working with the students? Whoever can start. <laughs> so, yeah, can I? Sure. Yeah. So one of the challenges, you know, uh, uh, that we have faced during the, uh, the course curriculum initially was that how to make our course curriculum more inclusive. You know, the curriculum has to be more very inclusive. The challenges, and uh, I think that one of those steps that has been taken uh, from the even from the university side is that that you can uh, innovate your pedagogy right so what you get what i have done in my class that i uh, had some peer group uh, in the, within the class itself and where the groups of the students were intermixing of the group so whenever you see that uh, there is a uh, there was a kind of trend if you see the students uh, once they are coming from say for example the eastern part of india so they will move a kind of blocks over there within the class itself and that is a quite a big challenge for me so what i have done i I understood their cultural background first there and this cultural background understand this I have mixed the group I have given an assignment so that they can go to the field work 
together to understand because in, in India, what the major problem is that we are uh, uh, really, you know, a lot, lot of uh, caste, discrimina uh, caste discriminations, which is one of the major, uh, major problems that we're having. So uh, we, are, we have actually worked together. I mean, even though my students are also very slowly and gradually, they become very vocal by the second or third semester. But then the first semester, they started mingling with each other and to know their cultural background and execute it into the, uh, through the assignment. So I think that one step actually broke the ice among the students. And that is, I think, very, very important uh, part for initial thing. Later on, by the second and third semester, because we have two years program, so in the third semester, they are completely changed. You know, they are completely, they come out with their own argument. They are, uh, they are actively participating in various social services and all. So this is one uh, observation that I can say that we have done it from our institution as well as in the, in the uh, MA in Sustainable Development Practice program itself. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. What uh, I asked about, and I think I shared the uh, the same experience with Pro. Uh, it, the biggest issue is when students come in with their preconceived mindset and ideas and values. And because of what has happened in the past, many people also have with some uh, colonized mindsets, and then it becomes difficult to understand the concepts of the MDP program, and then it requires a lot of uh, challenges trying to make them understand uh, and uh, we also we have also utilized the issue of group discussion and fit trip practicum uh, at Ibadan we have uh, two three types of fit trip practicums there are individual ones and then joint ones uh, we found that the joint fit trip by the students has gone in a, a, a long way in trying to disabuse their mindset on how to be, live, behave with the others, to relate with the others, and to shaping their thoughts towards decolonization. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would have similar comments um, to what both of you said. I was going to talk also about colonial mindsets um, being very deep and entrenched, and it, it looks very different in our US students who sometimes um, become so paralyzed by critique and they feel like they have nothing to offer and it's hard for them to even speak up or take a stand at all. And then sometimes we have African students when we're trying to draw out their experience being so deferential to like a Western perspective. So it's hard to address those deeply entrenched colonial mindsets. And those were just big generalizations about our student groups. But another challenge for us is we teach in English and we know that poses challenges from a decolonization perspective. Um, only half of our students speak English as a first language. And we, we need to get better at finding ways to group students um, where they may be able to talk in our second or third language. We know that when students are able to talk in our native language, they feel more comfortable, they can think more creatively, they utilize different parts of their brain. So we, that's something that we're still figuring out how to do. Um, sometimes in our classroom, it's possible to have a, a French speaking group or a Spanish speaking group, but there's so many native languages that it's hard to do. Thank you, Dr. Andreotti. Thank you for all the presentations. I was very, um... I was very impressed actually with the amount of work that has been done already in this area. Um, we have in our work, uh, we, we do make sure we try to uh, document the, the, um, the failures uh, because we, we call it good data. <laughs> then we don't start from scratch, we start from experience. Um, one of the things that was very, uh, key in what we, we, we moved from um, what we would call uh, learner-centered education to world-centered education, um, because uh, a lot of the students came to us also expecting to be centered in the process. Uh, as they went, but then as they went into the communities, that centering of the self or of their learning or self-actualization ended up um, 
affecting relationships uh, and and uh, not allowing them to um, or, or they were left unequipped to deal with complexity basically and with the volatility of certain situations. So we've shifted our our curriculum some time ago from learner centered to world centered and we say to the students now that uh, what the program is about, what our courses are about, uh, are to equip them to deal uh, and to sit with and work through the difficult parts of themselves, uh, including the desires that they have been conditioned to have in this work, and also to <coughs> negotiate um, in the context of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So uh, it's very different uh, take on critique because remember the seesaw, it's trying to, to bring the seesaw to the, it's not about the greatness of anything or how everything is worthless uh, or the, the, the sense of worthlessness that, worthlessness that society incul inculcates. It's about being able to sit with, uh, with reality and work through complexity in, a dif in difficult situations and negotiate in difficult situations. So um, yeah, and, and there are mistakes that happen in that process as well. <laughs> we have a course that is available online um, called Facing Human Wrongs or um, Facing Human Wrongs, Navigating Complexities and Paradoxes of Social and Global Change. And in this course, for example, um, we tell students from the outset, check if this course is for you. It's not gonna be easy. We're not gonna coddle affirm or validate you from the outset. We are going to be asking you to look at the parts of yourself that can block this, the relation, uh, ethical relationships with the communities. And we also ask when they write their learning journals, would you like sugar-coated feedback, honest feedback, or brutally honest feedback? And the question is not necessarily a question uh, about the feedback, it's about how prepared they are to be read by other people, by indigenous people, by BIPOC people, uh, in a way that doesn't confirm their self-image. So this breaking of, um, of the self-image and uh, the ability to sit with yourself, uh, to face the world uh, with more, we, we, we talk about um, a compass of four ages, humility, uh, honesty, um, hyper self-reflexivity, and humor, uh, and, and being able to uh, see your own, sit with your own complexity as you face the complexity of others. And the problem is that we don't have a language for the internal complexity. And if we don't have that language, we are working generally on projections and idealizations. And when these projections and idealizations crash, uh, then, then we find ourselves in very difficult circumstances. So training the heart and the guts for this is very different from um, even Freudian education, I think. And, and we're just starting to do it and trying. We've been doing it just for four, the last four years we changed our curriculum. So lots of failures and mistakes to be reported as well. Thank you. So thank you all for your answers. And I guess I would like to take one of the questions of the public that is really related with this, uh, with this topic specifically with MDPs and the students and designing the course for taking a more decolonized framework. So I will just read it. One thing we are seeing in our programs is a reluctance of international development students to go out into the world fearing cultural hegemony. We have tried to position engagement from a variety of narratives. For example, we share problems but different capabilities, share values. My question then, how to prevent paralysis among young people who are hyper self-reflective? <laughs> I'll respond to that. I think we see very similar things in our program where especially our U.S. students can get trapped in that, that critique and feel paralyzed. So we really try and um, speak to the position our students are in. Most of our students are practitioners, so we try and 
make sure while we're doing the self-reflection that it's grounded and sort of actionable. We talk about what this looks like in the context of your work. Um, how can you practice that self-reflexivity and, and continue to move forward? How you can stay in that cycle of reflection and action and make sure it's a continuous cycle and you're constantly learning. Um, but we're, we're, these, our students are in their jobs, trying to improve, trying to move forward. So we, we, we talk about how to do this as a group and we share you know, different suggestions. But I, I agree that that's, that's a hard one to balance, that, that critique with, with the hope and with the action. Does anyone want to add something for answering the questions? Okay, so moving to the next questions. And this is like a different topic in all this. And it is making more practical the concept of decolonizations. So how to facilitate the transition and use of the concept from academia to practical actions, such as like policy design. <laughs> Professor Olanian, will you? <laughs> anyway, uh, well, uh, I think yeah, it's possible, uh, but it requires a lot of engagement. And some of the things, as we have identified earlier on, lies with bad site colonization. Uh, which is already rife with so many people, and it takes a lot of time before uh, they get out of their current procedure. Uh, and, and that's what we do. What we have been able to do with our MDP program uh, is not to stop at the students alone, but to also have a situation where uh, we engaged with policymakers and government people. Uh, we've conducted workshops for uh, parliamentary legislature in our area and also to some bureaucrats in our area, uh, just to tell them about this mindset change on how to de decolonize themselves and the procedure that they follow. So, but it, I'm sure it's going to take a little while for people to understand uh, because it's not even everybody that believes that colonization is wrong. You also have people believe that that's one of the best things that should happen so they need explanation and we still need a lot more engagement with many of these stakeholders to be able to go through. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Does anyone have another recommendation to make this more like practical and transfer the knowledge from academia to the real world? Professor Duda, yeah. Yes, so I think uh, one of the major challenges that one of the, uh, I think the questions that uh, which is there, that how we can literate decolonization to the industry, because our students at the end of the day, they need to go for the industry and they, they be it a development sector job, be it in private sector, be it research institutions, where they really, we need to orient uh, the, the industry bodies also. So in that case, uh, we are uh, doing a kind of network with the uh, alumni group, which is very strong and they are already there in the industries. And, uh, and also they are bringing those industry people uh, to the uh, campus so that we are having engagements with the students. The students are having discussion with them and they can share their views in terms of what they understand uh, in the regarding the social problems. The ministry, for instance, many students want to work on the subaltern studies. All right, the subaltern studies and these subaltern voices need, needs to be heard. So, and the many people, my own student, I mean, I have three PhD students, the three PhD students are working on the subaltern study itself. They themselves want to do. Okay, because one is working on the scheduled caste or the one of the most marginalized communities in India, scheduled caste population. Second one is working on the women farmers, which is a gender related, related work. And third one is working on the, uh, the livelihood issues of the small scale fishermen, which is largely comes under maritime anthropology. So now how it actually shapes and I used to engage with them uh, at a large scale, I'm telling you, because we used to conduct the seminars and symposia uh, to engage with industry body with the students. So the students should orient them. 
We should have a kind of, we, I mean, all the programs should have a kind of, let the students speak. Industry has done enough for us that we know that. So we need to orient the industries as well to make more affirmative practices. That I think one of the major problems that neoliberal economy teaches that less affirmative, more uh, uh, exclusive policy. We have seen in India, I, uh, I can't say other countries, but in India, I must have worked on the affirmative actions uh, uh, policies uh, across uh, the uh, industries and the listed companies in India. And I found that very bad shape. So I think the first way to go about the decolonization is inclusive policies. Uh, we have to orient to the, uh, orient to the industry bodies. Thank you. I, I would just build upon sure. both of these responses. I, I think as um, Dr. Lanre said, just in having students engaged in real world problems, making sure that you, whether this is a, you know, a, a field immersion class or whether it's just case studies in your class, making sure that that engagement is constantly happening and that you have meaningful partnerships, ways that you can, um, Talk, talk about these issues with community groups, making sure that you're, you're grounded in that reality. And, and for us, uh, maybe we're lucky because so many of our students are already practitioners. The separation between academia and practice is um, not, a, not a big gap for us. And something that we're really excited about studying is how the student's learning is translating into improved development practice. And that's engaging with our current students, but also with our alumni and um, trying to have uh, stronger ties to our alumni and keep track of their activities and get them to, to tell their sort of their own stories about how their education has affected their practice. So that's something that we're trying to do more in the future. Thank you so much. I will take another question from our audience. So this is a question for all presenters. How are you linking your students with professional bodies of their career developments? Do you search for civil societies, public sector, private, any specific geographies? It will be interesting to know about the colonial knowledgeable graduate networks to share with recruitment departments. Yes, maybe I should, uh, I should also start with this one. I, I think at Ibadan, what we do is that we are fully connected and we engage with most of the uh, organizations involved, uh, organizations that are civil, civil societies, uh, international NGOs, and we relate with them a lot because our students also need to go for internship. So it is important that we engage them before and so that our student will have somewhere to go for the internship. So it's a two way thing. At times it's the university that tries to engage these organizations directly and tell them about what we do and what our students can contribute to their development. And we find that in the past few years, once they start with one student, they've always asked for more, uh, which shows that uh, some of our students are contributing positively to some of these organization. Then they, in Nigeria, they have a, about four big organizations for civil society groups. Uh, they have an association that is big. We ensure that our university is, is a member of the organization so that we can always hear what they see and engage with them and also attend meetings that we we give opportunities to our students. Even when we don't go, because uh, our institution is a member, our students can also attend some of these meetings, uh, which is one of the ways that we have always uh, contributed. In the second way in which we have also liaised with them is through our annual conference. In Ibadan, we have what we call the annual sustainable development summit. And we make sure that we have a special session for NGO groups for civil society groups and which they have always organized and they are always participating. That which is a win-win thing, win-win for us because we, it sells us, sells our students, sells what we are able to do. And we win for them because they also 
are able to contact uh, our students and also have access to some of the knowledge products that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Olanian. Does anyone, yeah, Professor Duda? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, one of the components that uh, we, we, we think that it's very important to make the students aware of, uh, uh, of the real life situation. So we did a very innovative way because we have a separate uh, course for it because our students is mostly the graduating students. So, I mean, they have just done their uh, graduations and they're, they're very young, they're very fresh. Uh, less number of professional students, uh, very few uh, very few of them are here. So what happens is the they, majority of them are not well aware of the real life situations at the grassroots. So we orient them, uh, you know, take them to the, the remotest part of the country and uh, ask them to identify the survey of, that we call the needs assessment survey. So what is the need of the people? Say, for example, they're going to the indigenous communities and then they are giving, uh, you know, staying over there with the communities itself. And therefore they are mostly focusing on what are the, uh, you, know, so, you know, needs are there in the local needs are there. And then they would come back in the, in the campus after say staying after 25 days or 30 days and they would come back and, uh, you know, right a report on it and these data they will go for the next level that is a project design level and these project design would actually help them to get into the industry because this is a kind of experience that they have learned from the field they report recorded it and they make it a report and they they do for the, the project management purposes so this is the line the chain that has to be there otherwise uh, because the one of one most important part is that after coming back from the field students approach completely changes this is my own observation. I mean, students talking about uh, those uh, aspects uh, of the, the decoloniality, coloniality, see, they understood that, that there is a problem of uh, if, when you go to the field, when you go to the field, you will find the word with the po poverty means. And when you go to the field, what the hunger means? And they uh, they were sent the extreme part of the region. I'm mean, extreme part of the country. India is a huge country. And there is a, there are various places like Eastern India, Central India, uh, Southern India. So they are sent in uh, this uh, uh, region and they are, uh, you know, largely uh, staying over there for 15 to 20 days. It's a, it's a big deal for them initially, for the graduating students. Of course, those who are experienced, uh, it is not maybe uh, important, but this is for, this is a kind of curriculum that we developed to make them more grassroots understanding of the problem, be it poverty, be it hunger, be it health, education, gender. So every aspect of the SDGs we used to cover through, through this. So I have I'm shown in my slides, I've shown the, the assignments they have taken that I myself asked this one, please take the, select the subjects that you want and go to the field. Before pandemic, we, we did it in 2019 itself. So they chose their work. Somebody wants to want to work on the LGBTQ community. Okay, so this, somebody wants to work on it. Somebody wants to work on, uh, say, the women property rights. So these kind of argument, the thought process should come from their mind. And this is this is not uh, uh, present. And I think uh, we need to work on those mind and they we need to provoke them to come out. We need to ask them to come out their own argument so that they can, we can create a shared space uh, for, for, for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Professor Hubling or Professor Andrea, do you want to jump in? Okay, so before finish this part of the panel, uh, there is one last question in our Q&A and it is, where do you publish your good work on sustainable development education? Like what journals? I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking where people can find uh, the resources or your what you are writing about decolonization in sustainable development education. So the clarification is where should we publish? Oh, should. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. What oh. have we or where should we? So we did the clarification.
it, well, I, I think, it says, you know. where do you publish? <laughs> Well, in Professor Olania, you are on mute. So if you are speaking, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the issue of publishing, it's tricky yeah, because there's no one cap fits all for publishing. It depends on what you have done within the sustainable development education. It's a very wide area uh, and there are many journals that covers it. So it depends on the aspect, uh, is it on the area of pedagogy and the area of financing? Uh, it depends on the area that one is focusing on. Uh, what I think should happen for anybody is just to browse the, the top academic journal publishers, uh, Springer, Elsevier, Oxford, uh, and then read, read their uh, intro and their uh, blog, and then see which one fits you most. That's what I would advise. I, I agree. I think there's lots of different places where you can publish. Uh, I'm engaging more with the field of education. So, um, there's a lot of interest right now in in this in this area, in especially in North America and Canada specifically too, in relation to indigenous issues, and recently the um, revelation of the unmarked graves of indigenous children that has um, has been really hard uh, on the communities. I have put on the um, on the side on the chat what people have been asking about the facing human wrongs course because i think part, partly um there is a, there's an argument to be made about um there's there's an academic part to this work but there's a part about practitioners that doesn't have to be necessarily written in up in articles so um blogs and um i have i put there a document that a colleague of mine has created with other colleagues about decolonizing higher education so putting things out there and sharing with networks not necessarily even in final form in draft form has been part of of decolonizing practice as well because the problem with the articles is that they take two years to be published too and by that time we might already be thinking about other failures and have moved our thinking so I, I just created the list of things, including a list for Emily, um, when you were talking about the dispositions and the kind of inventory of competencies uh, or capabilities, we have always uh, also done an exercise like that. And we did that with communities and it was really interesting what came up in the exercise. So I put it there as well. Um, and the last thing that I, I, I have an article with a collective of, of students and, and other researchers that is called From Education for Sustainable Development to Education for the End of the World as We Know It, um, which then addresses the question of uh, ecological, uh, possible <laughs> ecological and social collapse and how people face uh, this issue. So we have several exercises that get people through difficult uh, emotions and experiences. And for our courses, that is extremely important that they go through the difficult emotions in the course rather than in the field. Um, and that they have some tools to be able to have a container for them to be able to together act together in, in a certain in a certain way but also to process uh, and we call it shit composting and we we take shit as, as as a sacred thing as we see in the community especially cow shit uh, as something that needs to be in, in composting also as as the uh, a sacred way of turning something into good soil for uh, ourselves for new ideas for for new generations to come so that they can learn from, from our mistakes and make only new mistakes in the future. That's the contract. So um, yeah, I think what uh, the list of resources I put there maybe answer partially the question, but also maybe opens up the possibilities. I think partly um, academia in the current model is not sustainable. 
uh, in the current model of production of knowledge. So in a way, uh, in decolonizing academia, we have to um, figure out how to let go of, of many of the benefits that it has. Uh, it still offers us in terms of our privileges, but also letting go of, of and probably a, 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 um, a model of knowledge production that is becoming obsolete. Um, without jumping on the bandwagon of a society that is only of information fragmentation. So how to redirect and recalibrate our uh, direction in knowledge production and in trying to interrupt the indifference and create different forms of coexistence with, without falling into the neoliberal or the even classical colonial or, um, yeah, at least this too, we, we need to, to learn from and not, not reproduce. Thank you, Professor Andreotti. Uh, Professor Dura Van Hubelin, would you like to suggest any other resource or any other way to share this new knowledge and this new, well, knowledge, this new framework? So I think, uh, uh, thanks uh, Professor Vanessa to give us a very wonderful framework uh, for sharing the ideas of uh, the, the knowledge sharing and all. And I think uh, one of the uh, major problem in any education system is that the, what are the methodology, the epistemological and methodological questions that we always raise, isn't it, Professor Vanessa, that we always fight with this problem, the epistemological questions that are that is there, and the methodological questions that is very, very crucial. And uh, I think uh, you know, Professor Vanessa has already shared her experience in the way to go ahead with it. And uh, so in my knowledge that uh, I think uh, we have to really proactive enough to uh, engage more north-south collaborations. And uh, here we see that a lot of south-south collaboration is there, north-north collaboration is there. But there are, you know, my students, uh, they themselves wanted to uh, discuss with their issues with uh, uh, their northern counterpart, which is uh, which is missing. And I think uh, in the through the global classroom, I think uh, uh, many of us we are already there in the global classroom. Professor Emily is there, Landry is there, so we we can uh, make a kind of platform for the student to engage more. So the more you engage, more they will know the other cultures. So we in anthropology, we quote and quote other culture. So the more you know the other culture, probably you can make a kind of cross-cultural understanding of the real life problem. So probably that will help us to get more of um, out of this thing. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Duda. And thank you for all the panelists for your answers and showing us these great examples around the world, how decolonization is working on sustainable development uh, education. And I think it's really exciting to see all the ideas and the recognition and acknowledgement that there are new frameworks to actually understand sustainable development and the big issues that we are facing right now. So we are now moving to the Q&A portion between participants and our speakers in order to allow participants the ability to turn on their camera and microphone for a one-on-one -on -one experience. We will be moving this event to a new Zoom link the link has been placed in the chat. Simply click on the link to access this new session and this one will close. So just see you over there and thank you very much.